Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction House where we have a really cool rifle to take a look at. This is one of the first two prototype Ferguson rifles uh, manufactured for British military consideration uh, by one of the best British gunsmiths of the time, a guy oddly named Durs Egg. <laughs> so uh, Captain Patrick Ferguson was a, a officer in the British Army in the 70th Regiment, and he came up, well, I shouldn't say he came up with this idea, because this style of rifle existed back into the early 1700s. And but what's interesting is Ferguson got a patent for it in 1776. Apparently whoever was issuing the British patents wasn't fully aware of the scope of prior developments, because, you know, Ferguson didn't invent this. But he was the first guy to really take it to the British military and get some limited success in it. This is uh, potentially one of the very first breech-loading guns actually used by a military force in combat, which is really cool. We'll take a look at the mechanism in a minute when we look up close at this rifle, but basically you have a screw breech that allows you to open the back end of the barrel, load powder and ball in there, close the breech, and fire. And this has a couple of notable improvements, notable advantages over a muzzle loader. Uh, one of them is rapidity of fire. You don't have to push, force the bullet all the way down the bore. You can just stick it in the back where it's really easy to put it in because you don't have to uh, engrave the rifling onto it. Uh, it is very accurate because it is a rifled barrel as opposed to a smoothbore barrel, which was much more common, especially in military service in the 1700s. Um, and it also, interestingly, allowed troops to be a little more tactically wise. And this is something that Ferguson was particularly good at and interested in. Um, so you could reload this gun from pretty much any position, including, say, on your back or on your belly. You could shoot prone and reload this rifle and fire again without having to go through the contortions of putting powder down the barrel and then using a ramrod down the barrel to seat a new bullet. This is a major problem if you're trying to, like, use cover and, and shoot from prone with a muzzle loader. You know, you have to slide the rifle back and it, it's awkward and slow, or you stand up and you make a really good target while you're reloading. So uh, Ferguson wanted to, he, he had this idea to improve, uh, to basically have an elite unit of, of troops in the British military who could make best use of a technologically advanced gun like the Ferguson breech loader. So uh, he presented two of these guns to the British military for trials and testing, and he what what's particularly impressive about it is that he did this. This trial was conducted on a particularly rainy, windy day, which normally is kind of the death knell for a muzzle loader. Like your powder is going to get wet, it ain't going to work. Trial's over. Well, because of this, because this system is a breech loader it's really feasible to shield the breech from rain when you open the breech, put in powder, keep it dry, close the breech, and be able to fire repeatedly. Um, and it's something he was able to do. He was able to show a uh, rate of fire up to six rounds per minute um, on targets at 200 yards, where he, al he almost shot the entire trial without a single miss. I think they said he had like three misses in the course of the whole trial. It was very successful. In fact, it was so successful that the British military actually decided to adopt it. Now they adopted it on a very limited basis. Uh, there were two guns initially presented. One of them went through the trial and was uh, handed over, was actually kept after the trial in the Tower of London as a pattern for the gun. The other one is this one. Um, they took that, tri that pattern gun and they made, they ordered a hundred more of them to be made. And they detached Ferguson from his regiment and put him in command of a company of a hundred riflemen that were going to be sent out to the United States, which wasn't the United States yet, it was the British colonies in North America who were currently uh, in the process of attempting to revolt against the British Crown. So what the British did is they accepted this rifle for a company level field trials experiment. Uh, Ferguson actually had his men all equipped with green uniforms, so they kind of had proto-camouflage, they had breech-loading rifles, they were well trained, which is an important point to make. Uh, most of the British Army at this point had minimal training. You know, if they got to fire a couple time, a couple shots per year, that's pretty good training. Powder and ball were expensive, they didn't do a lot of actual shooting. And most of the, you know, the, the line infantry was equipped with muzzle loaders and they fired in volleys. 
aiming wasn't really a thing. You know, you didn't really need to do it, they didn't get to practice it. Aiming was absolutely a thing for the Ferguson rifles, because these were rifled, accurate guns, and Ferguson trained his troops well to be able to make best use of that. So uh, they get 100 rifles, they set off to the colonies, um, they arrive in, I think it was, they're, they're in the field by June of 1777, and in September they're going to have their first, their, their real major combat uh, inauguration, which was the Battle of Brandywine. Now unfortunately for Ferguson, Brandywine, nothing, it, his troops don't really play an important role in Brandywine. So, uh, well, I'll tell you what, let's talk about the, the final implications of this gun after we take a look at how it actually works. If this rifle sounds familiar to you, it's because I actually had the chance to do some shooting with a modern reproduction, a gorgeous modern reproduction of a Ferguson, uh, several years ago. And if you're interested in that, you should definitely check out that shooting video because it's a really cool opportunity to get some hands-on experience with one of these guns. Uh, there will be a link to that in the end, at the end of this video. But if you haven't seen it, the way this works is with a very uh, rapid thread, rapid pitch screw breech. So if we take one revolution of the trigger guard here, and it opens this screw breech, you have access to the chamber right there, and what you would do is drop in a round lead ball, drop in a powder charge behind it, and then you rotate this, make sure I get it in the right direction, you rotate this back into position, it snaps in place over that detent, and that seals the breech ready to fire. Now these guns were all uh, meticulously handcrafted. Uh, Ferguson uh, oversaw the manufacturer, he approved every individual gun, and the, the lapping on the threads on these breech plugs were good enough that this was a completely effective obturator. Um, these didn't suffer from particularly badly from fouling, uh, although fouling in the chamber or fouling in the barrel would impact accuracy of them, and, and they had to be cleaned to be reliably accurate, as with all black powder firearms. But this screw breech works. Um, it's really quite remarkable. Take a look at this from the bottom. So open this up like so. Uh, there are, you'll notice there are a couple of cuts here in the side of this breech plug, and those are uh, when you, so the, the one place that does foul is the front face of this screw when the breech is closed. And these cuts are there to give that fouling a place to basically be pushed into when you operate the breech. Uh, rate of fire of this was allegedly, according to Ferguson, up to six rounds per minute. More typical for troops equipped with these was like three rounds per minute. But even Ferguson himself never really tried to focus on the rate of fire. For him, the advantage of this uh, was the, the breech loading, the, the ability to reload from awkward positions, and to, uh, and, and to be a little more tactically sound, as well as to have a very accurate rifle. Now looking at this one in particular, we have a couple of very important marks here. This it's, uh, is worn, but it says D Egg, serial number 2. This is the King's Proof. There are no military proofs on this rifle, uh, because it was not a military service rifle. This was manufactured uh, for testing. It was not, not formally a military gun. We have another D Egg, a Durs Egg, marking down here. Uh, Durs Egg, despite his funny sounding name today, uh, was one of the best British gunsmiths uh, working at this time. He was actually a Swiss immigrant. He moved to London in, in the very late 1760s. Uh, he actually started his career working for Henry Nock, uh, whose name you might recognize from the Nock Volley Gun, as well as many other guns that were uh, much more successful than the Volley Gun, uh, and really made a tremendous name and reputation for himself making really nice guns. So uh, these two first Fergusons, number one that's still, I believe, still in the Royal Armouries today, and number two here, uh, he was paid just over 31 pounds by the Royal, uh, well, by the government in 1776 when these were presented for trials. Also here on the top of the barrel we have a couple of Ferguson marks. Um, this is a, a Ferguson family crest, or family symbol, that was stamped on these guns. And then this would originally have said Fergus. And you can see the F, the R, a little bit of the G, and the S curved around there, as in Son of Fergus, or 
Ferguson. This has a rather delicate rear sight on it that would not be copied on the military guns, the, the hundred guns made for the army. Uh, you can see we have two additional rear sight notches here as well as that one uh, for different ranges. London, and I believe that would have had Egg's address, which has worn down. This rifle has a really good fine front sight blade to go with that rear sight, uh, and that's a very important aspect of it. This was a rifled gun. Uh, it was very accurate, and in order to actually exploit that accuracy you had to have decent sights, which is kind of a rarity on guns of this period. And you can see the rifling there. It's actually really impressively intact and distinctive rifling. There were a number of flaws in these guns from a military perspective. So one of them was the cost. Building a very finely fitted screw breech gun like this was far more expensive than a typical muzzle loader. You know, just having a rifled barrel was a lot more expensive than a typical muzzle loader. So that's one strike against them. Uh, in addition, the, the material removed from the stock for this screw breech and for the lock plate left the stocks actually really thin and fragile in this area, right around the, the trigger and the breech area. And in fact the, the known surviving examples almost all have repaired damage in this area. Um, when these guns were eventually collected up by the British military most of them were unserviceable, probably because of damage to the stock here. Uh, there are, you know, there are people who would, who would bring up this hypothetical question of what if the whole British army had been ar you know, armed with Fergusons? They could have just obliterated the American colonists uh, and, and prevented the United States from achieving independence. Well, probably not. In reality, issues like this, they're not sexy and exciting and cool, but they are extremely practical. So if a gun's stock is this fragile, the chances are, you know, uh, an entire army armed with these rifles would have massive problems with the guns breaking, um, and massive amounts of combat ineffective men with broken rifle stocks, and that's more substantial, more important, uh, that, that has a bigger negative effect than the positive that you get from having you know, a, an accurate and rapid firing breech loader. And I'll just point out here, if you would like to know more about this sort of rifle, I would recommend uh, DeWitt Bailey's book, British Military Flintlock Rifles. Um, this discusses the Ferguson in some detail with a lot of, of the original correspondence reproduced, uh, and it does actually show this particular rifle specifically. So, so on September 11th, 1777, the Battle of uh, Brandywine takes place. Uh, Ferguson's unit is deployed, is active at the battle, but they don't really do anything substantive as a part of the battle, uh, which is really unfortunate. The, the idea here was to have this tr you know, field combat experiment with a, a company of elite riflemen. They have camouflage, they're operating in small groups, they're doing everything tactically sound, and they're being led by an officer who is a huge proponent of these tactics. He understands them, he helped develop them, he, he developed the rifle that they're using, for goodness sake. And that's it's too often when military units try out these new tactics, they'll end up, you know, giving command of the unit to some officer who doesn't isn't interested or doesn't understand the new equipment that, that he's been given. And Ferguson's men really had every benefit that they could have uh, to prove that this this concept was tactically sound. And unfortunately, they weren't able to. Not really for any reason of their own, uh, and not for any fault of their own. They simply didn't end up in a position to be tactically relevant to the battle, and Ferguson gets wounded during the battle, and that puts him out of action. And this this company really was Ferguson's involvement was essential to the company. So once he's wounded and taken out of the fight in the aftermath of the battle, his hundred man company is split up. These men were all all had been taken from other uh, other regiments, and when Ferguson is is wounded, they're all sent back to their individual regiments, and the experiment pretty much ends after Brandywine, inconclusively. So, um, unfortunately for Ferguson, he would go on to take part in the Battle of Kings Mountain, where he would be killed, um, and didn't survive the war. So that pretty much ended the Ferguson rifle experiment on the part of the British. Um, uh, the guns that were left were eventually collected up. Almost all of them by that point were considered unserviceable um, in the British Army records, probably because the stocks broke, as we mentioned earlier. 
and uh, yeah, and unfortunately, this would have a, a significant effect in in cooling interest in breech loading rifles in the British military for some time to come. So, all right, I have to mention one last anecdote with the Ferguson rifles here, because if I don't, I'll never hear the end of it. And that is actually Captain Ferguson himself, with one of his rifles, uh, before the Battle of Brandywine was in a position overwatching a road and happened to see two unaccompanied officers ride past. He didn't shoot them. Uh, he didn't attempt to shoot them. He almost certainly could have hit them had he tried. He was really a very good shot and he was equipped with a very accurate rifle at the time. Uh, these guys stood out. He mentioned this in a letter that one of them was in a really distinctive odd uniform. One of them had a very large hat. Uh, and it was only later that he was told that in the area where he had been, he was uh, try watching for um, for rebel American uh, rebel troop movement. Apparently, General Washington, General George Washington, had been in that area with a French officer uh, on that day inspecting troops. And it is virtually certain that the two men that Ferguson watched ride by were this French officer and General Washington. And uh, he did not make any attempt to shoot them <laughs> because, well, it wouldn't have been polite. It wouldn't have been proper. Uh, these men weren't at the head of troops. They weren't aggressive in any way. They never even knew that he was there. Uh, they didn't... They, they never noticed him. And, and for him, uh, his recounting was it just wouldn't have been proper to shoot them in the back as they rode past. And so he let them go. And really interesting that uh, General Washington could have uh, had his military career ended right there. And who knows what implications that might have had uh, for the American independence movement uh, at that time. Anyway, uh, a couple really cool pieces of history tied to the Ferguson rifle, of course, both with our own independence and revolution, uh, and just the technological aspects of a breech-loading gun in the 1770s. So this particular one, uh, unfortunately by the time you see this video this has already sold, but uh, it is one of the things that was on consignment uh, here at the Morphe Auction House for sale. Uh, an exquisitely cool piece of history. So uh, thank you all for watching. Stay tuned tomorrow. We'll have uh, another cool forgotten weapon.